Judges 9 is the story of Abimelech, who was Gideon's son. And here's the question I want to ask you. As we look at Abimelech, I want you to, to compare in your mind how is Abimelech and his rise to power and, ri and rising to leadership, how is that different from Gideon and how he rose to leadership? So that's the question. I want you to compare in your mind. We've studied Gideon. That's in chapter 7, chapter 8. That's the whole story of Gideon. So the question I want you to ask yourself is, we've already studied Gideon. We know the, the details. We can go back and look at it more. How is that different than Abimelech, who is Gideon's son? And you're going to see it's a lot different. And what ends up in the end is a lot different. It plays out very differently. So I'm going to ask the question, what did, what's the difference? And then what do we learn from this? How should we walk? Francis Schaeffer wrote a book called How Should We Then Live? Based on everything we know, how should we live? That's a great question. How should we live in this world? So let me look at uh, Judges chapter 9 with you. I'm going to read through this. It's a little detailed, and there's a lot in this chapter. How many verses is it? 57? Ooh, 57. So I don't know if we'll get through all of it, but it's the story of Abimelech and his rising to power and the details. But pay attention to how he is doing this. Yeah. Judges chapter 9, verse 1. Now this is right after Gideon has died. Verse 1. And Abimelech, the son of Jeroboam, that's Gideon, went to Shechem and unto his mother's brethren, continued with them and with all the family of the house of his mother's father. Let me just stop and comment. Abimelech is not in, let's say, well, his mother was called here a concubine, a servant of Gideon. She's not one of his wives. And in the Hebrew culture, a, a man could have wives and concubines, right. servants. But those kids of the concubines <laughs> did not inherit. They didn't, they didn't have the rights to full inheritance like sons and daughters would. So this guy Abimelech is a son, but not of one of the wives. So he's kind of an outsider. And we'll explain a little more of that. Um, his name, Abi. Remember Abba is father. Abi is fathers. It's a possessive form. His fathers and Melech is king. His father's king. So this mother named her son his father's king. Interesting. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Whose father? It was his father. Uh -huh. What was Gideon's father's king? God. Uh -huh. All right. So Abimelech has a great name. <clears throat> the son of Jeroboam, verse 1, went to Shechem. Shechem is in the land of Ephraim. It's not in the land of Manasseh. Remember, Gideon was of the tribe of Manasseh. That's down south. Mm -hmm. Shechem is up north. So he goes up to Shechem, where his mother was from, his mother's brethren. Verse 2, speak, I pray you, in the ears of all the men of Shechem, whether it is better for you either that all the sons of Jeroboam, that's Gideon, which are threescore and ten, mm -hmm. seventy, mm -hmm. reign over you, or that one reign over you. Remember also that I am your bone of your flesh. So just stop a second. What's he saying? He's going up to Shechem, where his mother was from, and says, you know, I think it's a better idea that instead of all of Gideon's 70, 70 sons taking over the leadership of Gideon, because he's died, I think it'd be better if just one mm -hmm. took over. And who do you think that one might be? <laughs> After all, I'm created to you by the That's right, because I'm one of your brothers, you know, I'm your relation. Verse 3, and his mother's brethren spake of him in the ears of all the men of Shechem, and all these words and their heart inclined to follow Abimelech, for they said, he is my, our brother. 
And they gave him three score and ten pieces of silver out of the house of Baal Berith, mm. wherewith, wherewith Abimelech hired vain and light persons which followed. So the brethren kind of got behind Abimelech and said, yeah, I think it'd be a good idea if you were the next leader. Here, we'll give you some money. So they gave him money, but where'd the money come from? Out of the house of Baal, Berith. And that just means God of the covenant. But he, that is a false god. They had made a covenant with the people of the land. And God had told them never to make covenants. With that was the land. like a, a piece of silver from each brother, 70 brothers. Yeah. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. Interesting that they gave him one per brother. One. At least, yeah, the same amount. Yeah. So he gets money from a heathen temple to do what? Hire vain and light persons to follow him. He's paying for a following. And what are they going to do? Verse 5. He went unto his father's house at Ophrah. Now that's where Gideon was from. And slew his brethren, the sons of Jeroboam, being three score and ten, upon one stone. Notwithstanding, yet Jotham, the youngest son of Jeroboam, was left for he hid. So what did he do? He hires these guys. He goes down to Gideon's town. Now, I don't know how he got all of his 70 brothers together. That's a lot of brothers. Maybe he threw a feast or something. We don't know. But he got them all together, and he killed them all in one place, what except that, for one, Joseph. I'm sorry. What is the one stone? It's just in one place. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah, they just... No. Well, no, but it took a while for them to slaughter all seven. Yeah. But the point is, they killed them all, except for the one Jotham, and he, he, hid, he hid, got away. Verse 6, the men of Shechem gathered together in all the house of Milo, and went and made Abimelech king by the plain of the pillar that was in Shechem. I'll talk about that in a minute, but that's it. Shechem, you remember, was the, the seat of the conquest, let's say. It was the military seat for conquering the new land. Shiloh is where the tabernacle was. Shechem was the military place. But something had happened in, at that same very spot. Yeah. Turn back to Joshua 24. Yeah, you're going back a lot further. Than oh, you. well, that happened there too. <laughs> I'm looking at uh, just recently. Okay. Joshua 24, verse 26. I had looked this one up. Remember when Joshua brought the people in, brought them into the land? He did things at strategic places. When he crossed the river, the first thing they did, they set up the monument, stones, and he read the law. Remember that? Because he said, this is going to be the law of the land. And in Joshua 24, he did something at this strategic spot. Joshua 24, 26. Joshua wrote these words in the book of the law of God and took a great stone and set it there under the oak that was by the sanctuary of the Lord. In verse 24, let me go back. So Joshua made a covenant with the people that day and set them a statute, an ordinance in Shechem. Hmm. I'm not real familiar with the, the geography of Shechem, but I've been told this is the same spot. So here's the point. Joshua had used that specific area and tied it to the law. The fact that they are going to serve God, they've made a covenant with God, and they say, we are going to follow the Lord God. That's years before. Now we have Gideon served. Now go back to Judges chapter 9. Abimelech goes to the same spot where leaders had proclaimed things. And what's he do? He's made king. Doesn't that, that go against God's commandments to kill 70 brothers? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Thou shalt not kill? He's not doing yeah, the right thing. Uh -huh. Yeah. Now, but, is he trying to proclaim himself essentially king of all Israel? He is. Okay. Yeah. But look back at chapter 8, verse 23. 
before Gideon died, because he's getting old, yeah. he said to them, because they had said, rule over us, yeah. you and your son yeah, and your sons. In other words, yeah. let's start a dynasty or a kingdom right. where right. it continues. And what did Gideon say? Verse 23. Yeah. Gideon said, that, I will not rule over you, neither shall my son rule over you. The Lord. Or rule over you. See, they were not in a in a kingdom. They were in a theocracy. We right. talked about this before. Uh -huh. They were in a beautiful arrangement that God had made in the promised land. Mm -hmm. God was their king. Mm -hmm. They didn't need a, a earthly king. In fact, God was a benevolent king. He didn't remember. He didn't require them to even serve in the military. Well, you see what happened when they made him king. He kills his brothers. Well, that's true. But the fact is, when God was king, none of that would happen. He didn't force anybody. Remember, if you had just built a house, you were allowed to go home, be with your house, your wife. Um, if, you feared, if you were afraid, yeah. you didn't have to even go. Because God only invited people to be a part of what he was doing. He never forced anybody. That was the arrangement, the theocracy. Yeah. So what they're yeah. doing here is they're going against God. Right. And Gideon had known that. That's why he said... No, we only have judges. We don't have kings. A judge is a person who is simply God's representative carrying out the work here, but is not a king. Remember when Samuel, I think we've talked about this before, Samuel, they wanted a king. Samuel complained to God and said, they want a king. And God said, don't worry about it. They're not rejecting you, they're rejecting me. That's right. And he tried to talk him out of it. A king is going to force your kids to serve. He's going to tax you. He's going to take your land away. And they said, we don't care. We want a king. Yeah, that's right. Well, see, God would never do that, but an earthly king would. Okay, so Abimelech here is made king. By who? Who made him a king? The men of Shechem. The men of Shechem. Right. So is God in this at all? No. Well, I don't think God would have killed him. So we're gonna we're gonna ask that question again. What's the difference between the way Gideon rose to power? All right. So let's keep going. And when they had told it to Jotham, now this guy's a brave guy. Yeah. He's the youngest of all the boys, but or the youngest of let's say the sons. He went and stood in the top of Mount Gerizim. Now, if you remember, Gerizim and Ebal are the two mountains. Shechem's in the middle. Yes. So you got one on one side, you got one on the other. The blessings and the, the curses. Blessings and the curses. And they were told back in Deuteronomy, when you get to the land, you're going to read the blessings and the curses. The blessings are from Gerizim, and Ebal is the cursing. Mm -hmm. And there must, I think Dr. Harrison even told us, there's phenomenal acoustics. Oh, wow. When you're on that mountain, right. you can speak, and the town of Shechem down below, modern day, whatever wow. it's called, can hear you don't need an amplifier. You no. just speak with your, a voice like this, and they can all hear it. Wow. And then Ebal on the other side, you can speak, and they can hear it. Okay, so in Deuteronomy, they were told, when you get to the land, you send, you leave the ark in the middle, and you go up the two sides, and half the mm -hmm. priests are going to give the blessings, and half are going to give the cursings. Beautiful, beautiful arrangement. So what's Jotham do? Again, he goes to a very strategic spot. He goes up Mount Gerizim, which was the blessing mm -hmm. side, mm -hmm. which is interesting. And he tells a story. Now, you guys like stories, little parables? Yeah. Now, if you can imagine, here, they just made him king down in Shechem by the oak tree and all this stuff, by where the temple, mm -hmm. the temple of Baal Berith is. And up on the mountain, hey, I've got a story for you. And they're all looking up. You know, use your imagination. Yeah. Like, uh -huh. what's going on up on that mountain? And they're all listening. Okay, let's read the story. Sometimes, by the way, you can get a point across much better if you illustrate it. Tell a story than just facts. So look, let's read the story. Oh, verse 7. He told When they told it, Jotham went and stood on the top of Mount Gerizim, lifted up his voice and cried and said to them, Hearken unto me, you men of Shechem, that God may hearken unto you. Here's the story. 
The trees went forth on a time to anoint a king over them, and they said to the olive tree, Reign over us. But the olive tree said to them, Should I leave my fatness, wherewith by me they honor God and man, and go to be promoted over the trees? And the trees said to the fig tree, Come thou and reign over us. But the fig tree said unto them, Should I forsake my sweetness and my good fruit, and go to be promoted over the trees? Then they said to the vine, <clears throat> Come thou and reign over us. And the vine said to them, Should I leave my wine, which cheereth God and man, and go be promoted over the trees? And they then said all the trees to the bramble, you know what a bramble is. A oh, yeah. thorn bush. Right? Come rain over us. That's pretty sad when you're asking a bramble to rain over you. Oh, yeah. Amen. And the bramble said to the trees, If in truth you anoint me king over you, then come and put your trust in my shadow. Really? <laughs> and if not, let fire come out of the bramble and devour the cedars of Lebanon. Now, therefore, if you have done truly and sincerely in that you have made him like king, and if you have dealt well with Jeroboam and his house, and have done unto him according to the deserving of his hands, for my father fought for you and adventured his life far and delivered you out of the hand of Midian, and you are risen up against my father's house this day and have slain his sons, three score and ten minus one, of course, upon one stone, and have made Abimelech the son of his maidservant king over the men of Shechem, because he is your brother. If you have dealt truly and sincerely with Jeroboam and with his house this day, then rejoice, you and Abimelech, and let him also rejoice in you. That's what they call kind of tongue-in-cheek. If you've done Amen. the right thing, great, great. What a great day this is going to be. Look at verse 20. But... If not, in other words, if you have not done the right thing, let fire come out from Abimelech and devour the men of Shechem and the house of Milo. And let fire come out from the men of Shechem and from the house of Milo and devour Abimelech. And Jotham ran away and fled and went to Beer and dwelt there for fear of Abimelech, his brother. So let's stop there. So What's he the, do? Was that the starting of the pub? He went to beer? No. <laughs> all right, all right. I should have said bear. air. <laughs> all right. So what's he do? He tells them a story. That the trees meet one of the kings. So what did they do? What he's doing is getting them thinking about yeah. what it is they're really yeah. doing. Yeah. So really, so they, they got to slow down and think, yeah. what about what you're doing? Instead of getting all... Excited to have a king, you know. He's exposing something. Exposing Think about it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The fact that they have chosen a king, but the lowest of all. Yeah, a maid really? servant's son. They haven't, they haven't chosen a majestic king. No. Someone they can be proud of. They've chosen the lowest, the bramble bush. <laughs> so that's one point out of the story. The other point is he's prophesied the fire is going to come out and there's going to be a lot of destruction. Mm -hmm. Not only of the bush, but also of the people to whom the men of Shechem. Mm -hmm. So there's going to be fire going both ways, and there's going to be devastation in the end. Mm -hmm. Okay, <clears throat> so Jotham ran away, verse 21. Yeah, I would too <laughs> if 69 or so of my brothers got killed and I'm the only one alive. You have your hand up? Once Mama? again, you have the youngest... Yes. Talking to the older. Oh. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so verse 22. When Abimelech had reigned three years over Israel, then God sent an evil spirit between Abimelech and the men of Shechem. Mm. And the men of Shechem dealt treacherously with Abimelech. Isn't it interesting that he got three years of reigning in, and then God does something. He yeah. begins a process of alienation. They maybe they got tired of him. Maybe they realized this guy is really a bramble bush. Yeah, yeah. He's not. There's nothing majestic about him. Of course, think about how he started. Yeah. He didn't start the best way. That's how politicians work. 
So it says God <laughs> sent an evil spirit. And uh, I think, you know, we need to take note of that. That God does deal in the affairs of men. Yeah. He can send confusion. He can send an evil spirit between. All right. So after three years, verse 24, that the cruelty done to the three score and ten sons of Jeroboam might come and their blood be laid upon Abimelech, their brother. So that's kind of an editorial comment. God did that so that he would pay for what he did, mm -hmm. which slew them upon the men of Shechem, which aided him in the killing of his brethren. And the men of Shechem set liars in wait for him on the top of the mountains. And they robbed all that came along that way by them, and it was told of Bimelech. So the men of Shechem are starting to mess with the commerce, traveling. Now, Bimelech's the king. He's supposed to be in charge of all this, keeping order. And these guys of Shechem... They're messing up the system. And they're, it says here they're assaulting people coming and going. Verse 26, And Gael, the son of Ebed, Ebed, came with his brethren and went over to Shechem. And the men of Shechem put their confidence in him. All right, so what's this? Well, this is some new guy coming on the scene. Right? Uh, this guy realizes that Bimelech, he's, he's worthless. He's not doing his job. He's not protecting Shechem. And so now there's a new guy, Gaul. And the men of Shechem start putting confidence in him. Verse 27. And they went out in the fields and gathered their vineyards and trod the grapes and made merry. And went into the house of their gods and did eat and drink and cursed Abimelech. In other words, with Gaul in charge, he did away with all the riffraff. And now they can go out freely into the fields. But what are they doing? Now they're celebrating. Cursing Abimelech. Verse 28, And Gaul, the son of Ebed, said, Who is Abimelech and who is Shechem that we should serve him? Is not he the son of Jeroboam and Zebal, his officer, to serve the men of Hamor, the father of Shechem, for why should we serve him? In other words, he's getting the people to say, quit serving Abimelech, come follow me. Mm -hmm. Would to God this people were under my hand, and I would remove Abimelech. And he said to Abimelech, increase your, end of your army and come on out. He's threatening. Mm -hmm. Come on out and fight. Zebul, the ruler of the city, heard, these, heard the words of Gaul, the son of Ebed. His anger was kindled. So this guy, Zebul, he's another guy. He's like the manager in the city. Mm -hmm. He doesn't like the words of Gaul. Verse 31, he sent messengers to Abimelech privately, saying, Behold, Gaul, the son of Ebed and his brethren, be come to Shechem, and behold, they fortify the city against thee. <clears throat> Taking the city away from him. Now therefore, up by night, thou and the people that is with thee, and lie in wait in the field. So here's the plan. They're going to try and get rid of this riffraff. <clears throat> Verse 33, It shall be that in the morning, as soon as the sun is up, <coughs> rise early and set upon the city. And behold, when he and the people that is with him come out against thee, then mayest thou do to them as thou shalt find occasion. Abimelech rose up and all the people that were with him by night and they laid wait against Shechem in four companies. So remember, the Shechem has now turned. They are not loyal to Abimelech anymore. They're loyal to this other guy. Right. So Abimelech's bringing his army in and, or fighters in and they're going to they're gonna lie wait for him. And Gaul, the son of Ebed, went out and stood in the entrance, entering, entering, entering of the gate of the city. And Abimelech rose up, and the people that were with him from lying in wait. <clears throat> when Gaul saw the people, he said to Zebul, Behold, they're come down from the top of the mountains. They're come people down from the top of the mountains. <clears throat> and Zebul said to him, Thou seest the shadow of the mountains, no. as if it were men. Uh -huh. And Gaul spake to him again and said, See, there come people down by the middle of the land. 
<coughs> and another company come along by the plain of Moenemia. This is kind of an interesting detail here, that he thinks he's just seeing shadows. Right. But you know, God is using all of us. Ooh. It's delaying them getting ready for the attack. <coughs> Verse 38. Then said Zebul unto him, Where is now thy mouth? Wherewith thou saidst, Who is of Imelech that we should go serve him? Is not the, this people that thou hast despised? Go out, I pray thee now, and fight with them. And Gaul went out before the men of Shechem and fought with Abimelech. So they do engage in battle. And Abimelech chased him, and he fled before him. And many were overthrown and wounded, even unto the entering of the gate. What was the prophecy that Jotham said was going to happen? That out of the bramble was going to come fire, and out of the men of Shechem was going to come. There's going to be fire both ways. Well, here we have we have Shechem coming out, Abimelech coming in, we got uh, fire coming both ways. Verse 44. No, wait a minute, 43. And he took the people and divided them into three companies and laid wait in the field and looked. And behold, the people were come forth out of the city and he rose up against them and smote them. So there's the fire. And Abimelech and the company that was with him rushed forward and stood in the entrance of the gate of the city. And the two other companies ran upon all the people that were in the fields, and they slew them. There's a lot of slaying going on. Yeah. <laughs> and Abimelech fought against the city all that day, and he took the city and slew the people. So there's the fire coming out of the city, and then there's the fire coming out of the bramble bush, Abimelech. But Abimelech, it says, beat down the city and sowed it with salt. Yes. And when all the men of the tower of Shechem heard that, they entered into a hold of the house of the god of Bereth. So apparently in this temple there's a tower. Well, guess where the men of Shechem hide? In the tower. And it was told Abimelech, verse 47, that all the men of the tower of Shechem were gathered together. And Abimelech Gat him up to the Mount Zalman, he and all the people that were with him. And Abimelech took an axe in his hand and cut down a bough from the tree. See, this was the first guy going out cutting Christmas trees down. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So he gets an axe and goes and cuts down a tree or something. And took it and laid it upon his shoulder and said to the people that were with him, What you have seen me do, make haste and do as I have done. And all the people likewise cut down every man his bow, followed Abimelech, and put them into the hold, and set the hold on fire upon them, so that all the men of the tower of Shechem oh died. Oh By fire. About a thousand wow. men and women. They wow. smoked them out. So it wasn't just women, it was women and yeah. yeah. Whoever was hiding in that tower, or that fortified area, got smoked out and killed. Let me read a verse. I couldn't help but think of this verse. While you're thinking of this tower that didn't protect them, Proverbs 18.10. Here's what it says. The name of the Lord is a strong yes. tower. The righteous run into it and are safe. Hmm. What, what is the reference on that? Proverbs 18.10. Yeah. <clears throat> I just thought this tower didn't protect them, but there's another that will. Okay. Mm -hmm. Then, oh, he's he's not a nice guy. To say the least. I mean, to kill all your brothers to start out with, you know? Well, okay. they, they picked him, now they're suffering. That's right. Uh -huh. Then went Abimelech to Thebes and encamped against Thebes and took it. Now, this is another little town. Okay, he's on a rampage now. He's right. He has now squashed the rebellion in Shechem, and he's like, okay... This isn't going to happen anywhere. The next city over there, I'm going to go do the same to them. Yeah. I'm going to teach these guys a lesson. So he's becoming a very mean king. Mm -hmm. So what's he do there? Well, let's see. 
Verse 51, but there was a strong tower within the city. Uh-oh. And thither fled all the men and women, and they of the city, and shut it to them, and got them up to the top of the tower. And Abimelech came to the tower and fought against it, and went hard unto the door of the tower to burn it with fire. He's going to try the same technique. Yeah. Let's smoke them out. Except this time, it didn't work. And a certain woman cast yes. a piece of millstone. Thank you, ladies. Yes. You know, if you have to use a millstone yeah. or a pot in a pan, throw it on their head. Yeah. You know, great things. How Women have done use great a things. Oh, well, it was probably you know, one of these smaller ones. It probably yeah. wasn't just yeah. humongous. Right. right. You know, for a little bowl <laughs> and a little wine. And a certain woman. It says a piece of a millstone. Cast a piece of a millstone oh, upon a Abimelech's head, and it broke his skull. So she just dropped it off. She must have either had great aim, yeah. or the Lord guided it. Yeah. I mean, here's an army out there, and she hits the king. Yes. How's that possible? Well, God was, was right in. under the window. <laughs> Well, he was at the bottom of the tower. He oh, yeah, he was. Frosted for every morning. And they were starting to try to smoke him out. Anyway, verse 54. Then he called hastily unto the young man, his armor bearer, and said, Draw your sword and slay me, that men say not of me, a woman slayed me. Oh. <laughs> yes, yes. Can you imagine? This oh. guy's so prideful. Oh, gosh. That he doesn't even want to die well, from the skull. He wasn't dead yet. And the woman's. Slay me that the men not say of me a woman slew. And the young man thrust him through and he died. Finished him off. When the men of Israel saw that Abimelech was dead, they departed every man to his own place. It's over. Let's go home. The bad influence is out, is out of here. Let's go home. Now look at verse 56. Thus God rendered the wickedness of Abimelech Remember, my father's yeah. king, mm -hmm. which he did to his father in slaying his 70 brethren. Mm -hmm. And all the evil of the men of Shechem did God render upon their heads, and upon them came the curse of Jotham, the son of Jeroboam. Mm -hmm. I think I find it interesting yeah. that yeah. Abimelech killed all his brothers on stone. And then how did he die? Oh, that's great. <laughs> the stone comes back and takes him out. God has a sense of humor, doesn't he? Okay, so let's let's just wrap it up with the question. What's the difference? In the previous chapter, we had a humble man named Gideon who was approached by God. Now think here. Approached by the angel of the Lord and wow. said... Hail, valiant warrior. He looks around like, like that's me. <laughs> he says, I'm of the smallest tribe, right. the smallest family in the tribe, and I'm the youngest in the family. How much lower can you get? How am I a valiant warrior of the Lord, the Lord of hosts? And what God did is he picked him, right? As in his humility, now he had a little trouble Right. You know, following through because, or at least getting started, he wanted some signs. Yeah. And God never criticized him for that. Mm -hmm. Signs were to encourage him. Yep. And God used him. Remember when he drew an army together? God said, it's too big. Yep. Yeah. Too big. Because see, I'm in charge. I just need you to carry out some things, but I'm going to do it. And so he whittled, whittled it down to what, 300 men? And then how did they do it? With a pitcher and a, and a torch, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, how do you win a battle with a pitcher and a torch? Yeah. And the sword at your side. But See, God was in it. And so God led Gideon the whole way. He prospered him. I mean, to have 70 kids? That's just a you gotta, you got to have some income for that, right? <laughs> <laughs> and how do you provide for all those wives? That's the sons. That's the sun's yeah. Well, when did he find time to leave? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, he was on top of college. <laughs> so that's Gideon. Uh, 
Yeah, what? <laughs> yeah, but with one, one way. One way. <laughs> what I'm saying. Gideon, I don't know, can one wife produce 70 kids? I don't well, think so. No. Yeah. No. 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 So God prospered him. No. Let's, let's, let's just leave it at that. God prospered him. Abimelech, on the other hand, how did he do it? Did God come to him and say, Abimelech, I've got my hand on you, mighty warrior of God. I can force the issue. Uh. And, he was and then in order... Soft. He's just totally opposite. And then in order to solidify his standing, what did he do? Slaughtered off all the other ones. Yeah. Well, you know, his mother named him Father's King, right? Mm -hmm. I wonder if he was raised there. I mean, he must have been, you know. That may have been a name she chose intentionally. Yeah. Well, it has two different meanings. You could be honoring God. I honor my father's king, or I become. Yeah. And so, yeah, it's the way mother raised him. Yeah. So one of them followed God and let God really lay out a path for his future. Mm -hmm. That's good. The other one, on the other hand, Abimelech, what did he do? He made his own path. And at every point along the path, you can see that there's error. There's error. First of all, God didn't call him. Number two, you never see Abimelech asking God. Remember, they had the Urim and the Thummim. They had the priests with the yeah. breastplate. Yeah. That he could have asked, should I become king? And it would have been deep, deep, deep. <laughs> No. Right? Whatever stone would light up, it's like, no. <laughs> <laughs> What's that? He's probably using the fake one. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's true. And you remember we did see in the previous chapter that even Gideon, in his latter years, that became a snare. Remember the gold thummim that he did? Yeah. Maybe it started out as a great thing, but it became a snare. Yeah. Mm -hmm. See, and okay. his family. Yeah. Now, one thing I thought of, too, um, we've talked about the errors along his way, but he very carefully and strategically used special places in order to solidify his leadership, like the place in Shechem where, Joseph, where Joshua had very clearly said, we need to follow God, we need to honor his law, and Shechem was the place where God was really in charge of all the military, mm -hmm. whatever, campaigns in the Promised Land. That was a strategic spot. He's using it, but he's not using it in the right way. Right? Um, just a thought. There's nothing magical about a strategic spot. Nothing magical. But I think maybe it helps us in our thinking. I think I've told you guys that my father... Growing up, he had a chair in the living room. Uh -huh. And that was his chair where he read the Bible. And when Dad was in that chair, you didn't interrupt him. Well, I mean, if you had to, if it was an emergency. But we always knew that was his chair where he read the Bible. It was his chair. Now, is there anything magic about a chair? No. But in, I think for my dad, who was a very busy man, his mind was going many different directions. When he sat in that chair, that was his focus. He didn't answer the phone. He didn't eat. That was his Bible reading chair. Now you may say, well, that's weird. Yeah, but it helped him. It was it was a strategic location that helped him to focus on whatever he wanted to at that time. Okay, so I can remember my dad sitting there for a long time, coming in, Going out, working on a car, come back in. Dad's still in the chair. I'm going, hmm, guess he's working on a sermon. <laughs> I don't know. He's communing with God. There must be something going on. You know, I can remember that as a kid. Yeah. Now, again, nothing magic about a place. But if places can help you and routines can help you stay focused, then they're good. And so here's Joshua who used this place of Shechem for his military campaigns. That was like the, what do you call it? When you, the war, right? Room. It's where you do all your planning. Well, that was Shechem. And what's he, what does Abimelech turn it into? 
a place of Baal worship. Right. Yeah. yeah. What were you going to say? You say it's also the place where you can communicate so easily mm -hmm. by using the mountains, and that's got to be really important when you're doing something big like that. Yeah. That yeah. just gave them another mm -hmm. advantage. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's so, so sad to see that uh, the sons, oh, I mean, that this is what happened to his, his sons. Yeah. All on die but one, and he's no two, but yeah, it's just sad. You've got to teach your children the right thing. It seems to read from the standpoint that Gideon had this guy's Joseph's mother as his maidservant, but that since she was from Shechem, maybe Joseph was raised back in Shechem. We don't know. Not Joseph. Uh, Abimelech. 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 I'm yeah. sorry, I'm getting mixed up. Y'all okay. following me here? Yeah. It may be that he wasn't under the direct instruction oh, of Gideon. We don't know. Yeah. But whatever it was, the, it didn't. Mm -hmm. Whatever instruction there was didn't get through. No, it was just take power because he went the That's opposite. Yeah. Yeah. Just take what you want. So, any other contrasts that you see between these two? He used funding from. Mm -hmm. uh, Heaviness people. Yes. From the veil. To hire people. Yeah. Yeah. Dirty money. <laughs> <laughs> Dirty money. How long did Abimelech's reign last? Three, Three years. years. Three years. Yes. How long did Gideon? Long oh. 40. 40 years. Back in the previous chapters, 40 years. Four years. Oh, what's that tell you? Oh, and God's in it. Yeah. Maybe there's some longevity there. Do they get tired of being prosperous? That's yeah. what I don't understand. <laughs> so <laughs> all this come to a place where they're just like we're too prosperous. Let's make turmoil. <laughs> <laughs> all this destruction, destruction. <laughs> and it happened in three years. Yeah, that's just crazy. Uh, yeah. So with Jotham, he's obviously following God. He hears God, right? Does mm -hmm. it say any more about what goes on with Jotham? No. No, we don't hear much about him. We just know he, he came into the picture to give that prophecy, to tell that little parable, to get him thinking. Yeah. And then he, and then he <laughs> runs and hides. Yeah. Can't blame him. Yeah. Can't blame him. I mean, look what happened to his brothers. Yeah. But that's and symbolic. Would have had him killed if he stayed around. Yeah. That's symbolic for us. Maybe we have one major job. Do it, yeah. and then that's it. We disappear. Do our smaller jobs. <laughs> and you know what? Think about this. Think of how brave this guy Jotham was. Yes. He's witnessed seventy of his brothers killed yes. by this ruthless brother. And then he goes and he stands on the mountain and gives a. He just didn't issue a quick prophecy like I'm going to tell it and get out of here. He tells his whole story. Yeah. He's yeah. a brave guy. Yeah. But God used him. And that was a great point there, Sarah, that God uses people in our lives at certain times. So never underestimate the influence that you can have in somebody's life, however short. You know, God brings somebody into your life. I was telling, I think on Sunday, I was telling people that uh, for the men's breakfast, I always go by the Safeway. Mm-hmm. Six in the morning or so, and I bought orange, I buy orange juice. And there's a lady that works there, and I've seen her a couple times. And I asked her, "How's your day going?" She's, "Oh, oh, you wouldn't believe, you know." She didn't tell me the whole. And I said, "Well, can I? Would you mind if I pray for you?" And she looked at me like, "Are you kidding? <laughs> pray for a cashier?" <laughs> and there were people behind me. But you know what? It's okay. I just prayed for. Her. You never know what that's going to do. I'm not going to say she's all of a sudden going to be miraculously changed. I'm not saying that. It's just she needed encouragement. And she was the one that I happened to get in the line with. And she happened to tell me she wasn't having a good day. So what am I going to do? Just say, oh, see ya. No, because God put me there. So I would encourage you all to be a Jotham. If God puts you in a place, speak up. And then go hide. <laughs> Run for your life. Not for the whole day, at least mm -hmm. for the moments after that. And she'd be thinking about that for a long time. Yes, sir. 
So, you know, I look at this and I go, God was at work with these judges. He would raise up the judges. They turn back to the Lord. They have times of peace. And then it's like you have three wasted years. Yeah. And look at all the destruction. All, look at all, all the destruction. killing. Yeah. Yeah. And these people are supposed to be a light to the world of how <laughs> God is at work. That God is their king and how great God is. Really? What kind of a testimony oh, were they being yeah. while all this was going on? Then here comes their king and they got to run. Yeah. Come on. They were looking more like the world than right. like God's people. So that's another maybe application. You know, ask yourself the question, do I look like a Gideon or do I look like an Abimelech? Because if I look like an Abimelech, I'm looking like the world. Yeah. I'm doing things the way the world does. I'm paying for, for people to help me, you know, this and that, and not asking God for direction. Yeah. So let's pray that God use us as lights in the world. You bet. All right. So next week, Judges chapter 10. It's a short chapter, by the way. It's only 18 verses. So let's go ahead and pray. Lord God, we thank you for your word. Thank you for the applications that we can draw. <clears throat> and as we've said many times, the Old Testament is there for our learning. That these are our examples so that we can learn from them. Because they're real life people that made good and bad choices. Lord, help us to learn from these choices that they've made. Help us to think them through. And seek to follow you with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength, as the word says. We want to put you first. We want you to be our king. We want the world to see that we're different. We don't fit in with the world. We're different. We're lights. We're salt in this world. We make a difference. You've left us here for a reason. You didn't take us to heaven as soon as we became believers. But you left us here for a purpose. And we're on mission we're on mission to make disciples, point people to you, make a difference, encourage people. Lord, that's our goal. So take us home safely, I pray. Thank you for this evening. Thank you for each one is here. And we thank you for your word, too. And uh, thank you for the way that the word, the word washes our minds and washes out all that junk that we listen to. As we walk through this world, all the discouragement and the negative and the things that offend you. Thank you for washing our minds as we focus on you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right, folks. Thank you. God bless you all. Do your reading for next week.